Burying our heads in the ground won't make our uh, problems go away. You know that as well as I do. It's true. Burying our heads in the ground or in the sand are not going to make our problems go away. It's uh, amazing how many problems we tend to bring on ourselves uh, when we, we just don't give certain things proper recognition in our lives. For example, let's say you're a student and you neglect your homework assignments. In all likelihood, you're not going to be doing well in your class. That's just the way it goes. You don't study, you're going to be suffering in school. Or let's say that uh, you don't acknowledge your bills. What's going to happen then? You're going to destroy your credit, right? Your assets could get repossessed. Or perhaps uh, to think about it a different way, uh, you, you failed to, to drive the speed limit somewhere here in Tehachapi. And lo and behold, a police officer comes along and gives you one of those nasty tickets. I know I speak from personal experience. Been there, done that. Let me get even more personal. For whatever reason, you failed to deal with your halitosis. And your friends start to back away from you. That's going to happen. I don't care how godly you are this morning. You have a friend, you have a choice between your friends, either your biological friends or your friend Hal. And if you choose the wrong one, you're going to be seeing others uh, leaving uh, away from you. Yeah, it's amazing how many problems we, we bring on ourselves unnecessarily when we don't give proper recognition to certain things. I can remember when I was a single young man and I was attending a Bible study. And on this particular occasion, the, the Bible study teacher uh, gave a wonderful lesson on personal holiness, how, how you and I need to be holy. We need to live for God and, and deal with sin in our lives. And I was so motivated by this particular lesson that I was involved in, in jotting down some notes to prompt me to be more holy in my life. Well, evidently, I must have forgotten that with these notes that I had taken, I left them on the dresser in my bedroom for anyone to see and read. Sure enough, one of my non-Christian family members came along and, and saw this note and scribbled some choice words on the paper. You don't sin. You're a good boy. Stop listening to this bleep. How did I respond? Well, I responded probably the way many of you would respond in that same exact situation. After I got over my initial shock of feeling personally violated, and to be honest with you, somewhat embarrassed, I felt really sad for this relative who doesn't take seriously this whole matter of dealing with sin. Most people don't recognize sin in their lives. The last thing on the minds of so many people is the whole idea that they are have to account to God with their sinful lifestyle. And they may even think to themselves, listen, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm good just the way I am. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't sin. And people like you need to stop listening to that bleep. Some people would even uh, lead us to think that our society has evolved to the place where sin now is an archaic notion. That when you stop to think about what sin really is, it's just something that is imposed upon our culture uh, through religious people, uh, people who are really into old-fashioned, archaic, puritanical values. Listen, if you and I are to experience forgiveness from God, then recognition of our sin must be met. It's got to be met. Without a recognition on our part, 
that we have violated God's holy word and God's holy law, all prayer for pardon on our part is a sham. There was a time in King David's life uh, when he refused uh, to recognize his sin. And he allowed this sin to sort of fester and, and harbor in his lives to the point where it was, it was wearing away at his soul. It was, it was taking a toll on him. And just like a woodpecker that does menacing damage to the, the siding of a house, so it was that sin repeatedly was pecking away at David's spirit. Well, eventually, David got to the point in his life where he just couldn't endure his, his guilt any longer. At, at, at first, he tried to, to suppress his, his tormented conscience, uh, just like you and I might try to suppress a hacking cough with a mentholated cough drop. But after David gets confronted by this bold, courageous prophet by the name of Nathan. David sensed the enormity of his guilty conscience before a thrice holy God. The reality of his scandalous affair with Bathsheba, as well as uh, him being involved uh, with the murder of her husband Uriah, it just, it just weighed heavy upon David. It was messing him up. It was causing all sorts of turmoil going on in David's heart. Just by way of review, through our studies so far in considering King David and his, his prayer of confession, we discovered that there are two significant features to prayer. Just to summarize, we took notice of the fact that when it really comes right down to it, there is this element known as aspiration. What is aspiration? It's a, a word we don't talk or use very often. Uh, aspiration is something of a strong desire. It's an ambition. How are you to experience forgiveness if you don't even want it? Do people just whimsically get forgiven? and don't care about it in any way, shape, or form? No. We have to want, we have to aspire, have ambition toward forgiveness. That at least needs to be there. And King David expressed his aspiration, his strong desire to be forgiven in Psalm 51, verse 1. And it comes out this way. He says, Be gracious to me, O God according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Do this. Be gracious to me. I, I want your forgiveness. He aspired to be forgiven. We also took note of a second very important feature of true confession, and that's purification. Purification. Even though you may feel right now in your life that cleanliness is next to impossible. Spiritual purification can take place in your life even when there has been spiritual pollution. Once again, David was involved in seeking out for God's purification for him. In verse 2, he says of Psalm 51, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So how are you coming along with that? You know, before we go to the next phase of understanding what's involved with great true confessions on our part, it's important that you want it. It's important that you aspire after it and that you go so far as to seek uniquely after purification. Well, by observing how David poured out his heart in Psalm 51, we will see how recognition is also an essential ingredient to our being forgiven. And so if you have your Bible handy, I invite you to open it up right now to Psalm 51 as we take a deep dive into this passage. We're going to see this important ingredient of 
recognition in this passage of Psalm 51. It's not just good enough to want to be forgiven or to have faith that it's possible to be pure. Recognition of sin on our part must take place. We must see sin for what it is. We must come clean when it comes to sin in our life. Take it seriously. Look at how David did that in Psalm 51, verse 3. Notice what he says. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Well, what's involved with a healthy recognition of sin? How do you know when you are recognizing sin for what it is and that you are on the right track, that you've gone astray? Well, we give appropriate recognition to our sins, here it is, by taking personal responsibility for our sins. We're not involved in, in shifting blame to somebody else or saying, you know, the, the devil made me do it or uh, I've got bad genes or it is on account of my parents who put me up to this or some, some other person. No, we take personal responsibility for our sins. This, in part, is what ought to separate children from adults. I said ought to, because there are a lot of adults who are not responsible, right? And there are young people who are responsible. But, but children, part of being children is that it's understood they're not going to be completely all the time responsible. And yet we need to take it up a notch when we enter into adulthood. We give personal recognition to our sins appropriately by taking responsibility. Now look at how David owns up to his own sin over here in verse 3. He takes ownership by his use of, notice it, my transgressions and my sin. He doesn't blame God. He does not blame Satan or one of his co-workers. He doesn't blame anybody else. He recognizes that responsibility needs to rest squarely on his shoulders. You know, one of the reasons why I just minimize my exposure to politics is this it's like a situation where you just have a bunch of kids that are hurling dirt at each other. You know, they're uh, at uh, opposite ends of the sandbox and they're just, they're just chucking dirt at one another. They're doing this whole finger pointing thing. No, it's because of you that our country is in the fix that it's in. No, it's because of you. It's, it's the blame game incessantly. It's like a bunch of little kids just hurling mud at one another. And I don't know about you, but this is not the kind of way I like to entertain myself in my off hours, seeing who's at fault for doing this or that, rather than being solution-oriented instead of looking back and ascribing blame. Well, again, David doesn't try to justify himself. He's not excusing himself on account of some rotten, dysfunctional family background or, again, some negative social influences. He does what we need to do as well. We need to recognize that we stand alone before God. It's just you and God. That's it. It reminds me of in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And so just as I was just this last week uh, at um, uh, the hospital, the Adventist Hospital, and I had to go through one of those revolving doors, I didn't have anyone go with me uh, through the entry in order to see the guest. I had to wait for a person in front of me to take his turn, then it was my turn. So it is in our relationship with God. It's just you. It's you and him. And you and I stand accountable before the Lord with the one life that we have to live. Let's continue on here in our text um, by holding our place here, and let's flip back to 
chapter 32. Psalm 32 is an excellent cross-reference of Psalm 51, specifically verse 3. In Psalm 32, verse 5, David puts the full weight of responsibility squarely on his own shoulders. He's not blaming Bathsheba. He's not blaming Uriah. He's not blaming Saul, Jesse, or anybody else. He's saying, I'm responsible. I did it. Look at his use of pronouns that we find here. Let's do a little grammar together uh, in Psalm 32. And notice verse 5. He says, I acknowledged my sin to thee, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. Eight times in this one verse, David refers to himself as the one who rebelled against God by his use of the words I and my. It doesn't take a Phi Beta Kappa, uh, some individual who's a rocket scientist, to be able to see the personal ownership that David is taking for his own sins. You find just himself in this verse. You don't need to turn there, but similarly in Psalm 38, verse 18, David says, I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Have you left the straight and narrow way? Have you fallen away from the Lord in recent days? Has there been a time even recently, maybe even right now, where you'd have to say that you're not walking as closely, as intimately to the Lord as you could be? Maybe it's time that you come back home. Maybe it's time that you no longer played the role of the prodigal son or daughter and that you return back into the loving, gracious arms of our, our holy and at the same time loving God who loves you warts and all, idiosyncrasies and all, or as we say in Yiddish with our spilkas and all, just the way we are. You don't have to clean yourself up before you can approach the throne. Even if you have fallen away, if you would consider yourself even backslidden, Run back into the arms of the Lord who loves you unconditionally. Perhaps it's time to recognize your sin by taking personal responsibility for it. Maybe it's time you say with Job, I have sinned and perverted what is right. Job 33, verse 27. Well, there's more to recognizing our sin that goes beyond just taking personal responsibility for it. There's another component that we need to see here, and that is there really can't be recognition of our sin unless there is knowledge of it. There has to be an awareness of the sin itself. With that in mind, let's go back to Psalm 51. So segue from Psalm 32 back over to Psalm 51. We will spend the rest of this time in our teaching in this uh, chapter, Psalm 51. Notice how he brings attention to having knowledge of sin, that he's cognizant of the fact that he has blown it before the Lord, that he's not where he needs to be in his relationship with God. Notice with me Psalm 51, verse 3 again. He says, for I what? No. I what? No. no. I know my transgressions. My sins are not some mystery to me. My sin is not something that I'm oblivious to. No, 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 no. I, I'm aware of my sin. I'm mindful of it. It does not escape me. It's not lost on me. Moffat's uh, translation says, Well do I know my offenses. Harrison's translation says, For I am fully aware of my failings. One writer puts it like this. 
They who acknowledge their sins are in a receptive state for God's grace. They who ignore their sins are heaping up condemnation in the day of judgment. Wasn't that the the problem with the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day? These people who are just so full of themselves. These religious people, and they wanted to know, they wanted you to know exactly how righteous they were, how holy they, they were. They wanted you to practically genuflect in front of them. And, and, and I tell you, the, the people who Jesus had the most difficulty with were not sinful people, sinners like you and me. It was religious people. Religious people. People who, in our day and age, many of them go to church. They're very religious, righteous, spiritual. And so Jesus, you know, he's he's thinking of these these people and he says, you know what, guys? They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see yourself as spiritually whole? I can't help you. Here is God, the second person of the Trinity, basically saying, I can't help you. I'm the great physician. I can't help you become well because you don't even recognize that you're sick. And that's the beginning place for us, isn't it? When it comes to our sin, we take responsibility for it, we admit it, we acknowledge it, we are not in denial. We are not skirting from the facts. We're not being pretentious. We take ownership for our sins. I know my transgressions, David says. My sin is ever before me. I tell you, it's not possible for a person to be whole or spiritually complete if he or she does not see himself or herself as spiritually sick and in need of the spiritual doctor. Only those who know they need to be forgiven can receive forgiveness. If a person has no interest whatsoever in the forgiveness of God and does not acknowledge their sin, then there's no help for that individual. Let's do a little bit of a deeper dive here. What did David mean specifically uh, with these words when he writes, for I, in the Hebrew says, yada. I know my transgressions. What does he mean by this? That word yada appears um, approximately a thousand times in the Hebrew Bible. It expresses many shades of knowledge that could be gained by the senses. So what does David mean when he says, I yada, I know my transgressions? What, what does he mean by that word, let's, let's look a little bit deeper at this point. It can mean several things. It could mean to distinguish or to understand. Uh, that's the way it is used in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It could be used in the sense of a physical oneness between a husband and wife. And it's sad that I even have to clarify in this day and age, I'm talking about a biological gender man and a biological gender woman. That's how the scripture uses it. It doesn't acknowledge all of these different genders. Man, woman, that's it. Game over. No more discussion. The Bible makes it clear who is a man, who is a woman. It's not up for debate. But the word no can speak of that physical intimacy. It's also used of God's knowledge of people. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. I mean, God really knows you inside out, doesn't he? He doesn't just know the hairs on your head. He knows everything there is to know about you. There's that intimate knowledge. He knows whether or not you're focused on what I'm saying right now or you're already speeding further in your calendar and thinking about this week or what you're going to have for lunch. He knows everything about everything there is to know about you. Your likes, dislikes, your propensities, your inclinations towards sinning in certain areas where you're doing well. 
he has an intimate knowledge of you this morning. That's one possible way of knowing this word, no. It, the word also expresses man's acquaintance of God, according to 1 Samuel 3, verse 7. So which of these usages does David have in his mind? As we enter back into the mind of the human author, as inspired by the Spirit of God, what is David thinking about when he says, for I know, yada, my transgressions, my sin is ever before me? Well, there are only two possibilities. Either he could have meant, I understand, I have a comprehensive knowledge of my sin, or I have an intimate acquaintance with it. Uh, it's difficult for us to pinpoint exactly which of those two meanings can be wrapped up in the word no. Perhaps it is a collection of, of both understandings. But if David meant that he had an intimate acquaintance with his sin, then he used the exact same meaning for the word that speaks of the greatest level of intimacy between a man and his wife. That's one way of seeing it. David had such an intimate knowledge of his sin that he writes, My sin is ever before me. There often, when we talk about teaching, we talk about um, how the brain enters into it between abstract and concrete. And it's easy for us to just camp into the abstract world so that we are just thinking abstract thoughts. Let me help you with a visual of what David is experiencing as he's thinking and as he's possibly even writing out this verse. For I know my transgressions. I would not put it past David that every time he saw Bathsheba, his sin was ever before him. I would not put it past David to think every single time that he saw um, this growing child in Bathsheba's midsection, that his sin was ever before him. I would not at all be surprised if every time uh, David walked by the actual bed where he committed his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, his sin was ever before him. I would not be surprised uh, when we think about it that David had his sin ever before him as he, he would observe the place where Bathsheba was bathing and he first took note of her beautiful shape and he lusted in his heart. I would not be surprised if David, as he's, he's thinking about uh, Uriah's grave, every single time he walked by Uriah's, Uriah's grave and he knew he was personally responsible for the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, his sin was ever before him. David's sin continually was before him. It dogged his steps. It put a kibosh on his day. It affected him. Morning and afternoon and evening while he was eating, while he is leading the kingdom, while he's interacting with others, when he's trying to sleep at night, his sin is ever before him and is haunting him. He can't get away from it. It is sticking to him like slime. And it's grossing him out. He can't get away. It confronts him day and night. It never left his mind. To make matters worse, to prevent him from, for, from forgetting about his sin, enter God. God really tightened up the clamps upon David, both in mind and body. David goes so far as to journal the physical effects that he was experiencing because of his sin. Listen to Psalm 32, 3 and 4. He says, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning day and night. For thy hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. We tend to forget what summer is like, but we're moving toward it. And after the weeds are done, it's going to really start to heat up around here. When 
your upper lip is going to collect onto the top of your gums and your teeth. And you'll have to pull them down and you'll say, I need a drink of water. And so it was with, with David that he just was in a hot mess physically. And, and he brings out how God is doing this to him. Thy hand was heavy upon me. Is that where you're at today? You know the Lord, you love the Lord, but you're struggling. You've been battling, there's an area of sin, you've been tripping up, you've been falling, you've been tripping over yourself. You've been vacillating, you've been confessing, you've been repenting, confessing, repenting, confessing, repenting, back and forth, you've been having this whole yo-yo experience with God. And it feels like no matter how hard you try, the weight of your sin is oppressive. And it is taking its toll on you physically. And you can't get away from it. You feel trapped. Do you know your transgressions right now? Is your sins ever before you? If so, hear me loud and clear, please. Take personal responsibility for your sin. There is an exquisite, delicious quote I'm going to share with you right now. I think this will really help because some of our terminology messes us up and we start thinking wrong ways because they're not biblical ways. There's a wonderful scholar author by the name of Jerry Bridges who I think beautifully puts things in perspective. I just love this quote. Listen to this. It is time for us Christians to face up to our responsibility for holiness. Too often we say we are defeated by this sin or that sin. No, we are not defeated. We are simply, here it is, disobedient. Let that marinate in your spirit for a moment. You're not defeated. You're disobedient. It might well, if we stopped using the terms victory and defeat to describe our progress. Rather, we should use the terms obedience and disobedience. When I say I am defeated by something, I am unconsciously slipping out from under my responsibility. I say something outside of me has defeated me. But when I say I am disobedient, that places the responsibility for my sin squarely on me. See the difference? We may in fact be defeated, but the reason we are defeated is because we have chosen to disobey. We have chosen to entertain lustful thoughts or to harbor resentment or to shade the truth a little. I think it's time for us to make a shift in our thinking. As adults, God calls upon us to take personal responsibility and not posturing ourselves in such a way that that sin is a victor over us, gains the victory over us, but rather we in our own right are being disobedient. This is ultimate responsibility. This is what God calls the child of God to be before the Lord, to take ownership for it, to be responsible for it. Well, Christians are not the only ones who need to own up to their sins. We at least have a starting place, recognizing that we're sinners in need of the Savior. The world doesn't look at it quite that way. But if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to recognize your sin before God. Everybody sins. Everybody in this room sins. Some of us do a great job at it. Maybe we've already sinned up a storm before coming to church. First Kings, I believe it's 8, verse 46, says, There is no man who does not sin. No man. But it's not gender specific. It's talking about all people. Ecclesiastes 7.20, indeed, there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who 
never sins. We all sin. Genesis 8.21 says that we, that um, uh, people have sinned from their youth. The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Goes way back. Goes back to the time of conception. We'll see that a little bit later. But it behooves you, if you do not believe in Jesus, to recognize that you have violated God's holy word, his holy law. You have sinned against a holy God. There's no squirming. God is impeccably holy. Cannot even tolerate sin in his presence. Zero tolerance policy God has for sin. None. And that extends not only to the things we do, to the things we say, but even our thoughts. And because God is so incredibly, impeccably pure and holy, it demands us to deal with our sin once and for all. And so it's important, if you've never done this before, recognize the fact that you need to come to know forgiveness for all those foolish, sinful things you've done in the past, that you can start over with a clean slate. Today could become the very first day of the rest of your life. But you need to be cleansed. You need to be purified. You need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. You need to get right with Jesus. Not getting religious, but getting the relationship in place. I tell you, you will never get it right until Jesus is first place in your life when he's number one. Recognizing that he's not just your savior from sin, but your Lord. The word Lord, kurios, means master, owner, ruler, sovereign. He is the boss man. And when we come to Christ, we are yielding, we are submitting to his leadership over our lives. And so if you've never invited Jesus to come in as your personal savior from sin and as the leader of the Lord over your life, now would be a great time to come to him in faith, in faith. Jesus says, the one who comes to me, he will in no way cast out. So no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you come to Christ and he will not cast you out. For the rest of us, this would be a wonderful time for us to spend uh, a little time before the Lord taking responsibility for anything that we're aware of in our lives that is displeasing to the Lord and even asking the Lord, I'm not aware of, of that which separates me from you right now. I'm not even mindful of, of areas in my life that need to be confessed. Please bring this to my attention that I might openly confess before your throne and seek your cleansing. So let's spend a little bit of time in confession and self-introspection.